So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. We're very excited for today's topic and how to get involved in disability inclusivity research. We have three panelists that have had different journeys to get to where they are in this field. So we have Dr. Maxieng, um, Dr. Mahadeo Sukai, and Ms. Igbetter, Elizabeth Igbetter. So yeah, um, Elizabeth, I believe, is here. So this webinar is staged as a panel discussion. So um, composed of accomplished researchers at various academic career stages um, and disability inclusivity research. And um, we also have a more professional side outside of academia that they're involved in. So you can gain insights on the research side of pursuing a career in disability inclusivity research and also outside of that. So this will follow with whether students should pursue a PhD in disability inclusivity research, reviewing the pros and cons of that route and allowing panelists to discuss the barriers they've overcome in academia. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. And so we have Dr. Muriel Maxing. So Dr. Maxing has a PhD in public health, global health from the University of Montreal and is starting her postdoc research at Dalalana School of Public Health at University of Toronto. She holds an undergraduate degree in nursing sciences and a master's of applied sciences from McGill University. Before her doctoral work, she worked for several, several years with the Humanity Inclusion, formerly called Handicap International. During the past decade, Muriel lived, with, um, lived and worked overseas on projects related to community health, sexual and reproductive health, including HIV and AIDS, gender-based violence protection and disability in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So she's very accomplished. Amiriel is a passionate advocate of social justice for marginalized populations, notably people with disabilities to exercise their basic human rights and have fair access to health. Now we have Dr. Mahadeo Sakai. So Dr. Sakai is head of research for CNIB, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, Dr. Sakai is an internationally accomplished biomedical research scientist. He is also the world's first congenitally, congenitally, congenitally blind biomedical research scientist. As a principal investigator for the book, Creating a Culture of Accessibility in the, scientists and the Sciences, Dr. Sakai provides insights and advice on practically building inclusive research teams. Now we have um, Elizabeth Igbetter. Elizabeth Igbetter recently submitted her final PhD thesis, so congratulations, Elizabeth. Um, she has been working with the Ghana Blind Union for 16 years as program manager. She has a keen research interest using research in her practical work and carries out research. So she's very passionate about how research needs to be applicable to improve the lives of everyone in our communities, including people with disabilities. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for our participants, I'd like to ask you to mute yourself as you enter the session. And please refrain from using the chat function unless during interactive parts of our discussion and panel. Um, for the reason for that is because we use screen readers. We have participants that use screen readers and the chat interferes with that function. If you have any comments or questions to make, please use the raise hand function. And at the end of our session today, we'd like, you to, uh, we'd like to ask you to um, fill out a short survey on your experience to help our team make this, uh, these webinars as accessible and relevant for you as possible. I'll be adding the survey in the chat at the end of our discussion. So I'll start the session by asking a question at a time and then we'll have um, a small discussion among the participants. So yeah, I'll give you around five minutes for each panelist to answer. So first of all, how, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, actually, um, I guess we'll start with Dr. Maxine. So thanks a lot, uh, Laiva, and I'm very happy to be part of uh, this webinar with uh, Dr. Mahadeo Sukai and the future Dr. Elizabeth uh, Agbeta. Um, so we received the questions from uh, Laiva before this uh, webinar. So the first question was, how um, I decided to uh, do research and how I got uh, in interested in um, disability inclusive uh, research. So to this question, I cannot really pinpoint a specific moment in my life when I decided to do um, 
uh, research on a regular basis. But what I can say is that the desire to, um, to do disability inclusive research was gradual and was really in response to uh, recurrent answers from um, decision makers, ministries, donors uh, with uh, whom I was working in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, telling me that there is not enough data and evidence to mainstream disability into a national uh, uh, planning um, strategies or in, in uh, national uh, programs, for example, uh, on HIV and AIDS. So really, uh, it was very frustrating for me. And, I decided to quit my job, in fact. <laughs> uh, like Leiva was saying, I was uh, working with um, Handicap International called uh, Humanity and Inclusion Now. And I quit my job and I decided to uh, go back to school and pursue my doctoral uh, studies in, um, in public health and global, global health. So this is how I decided to, um, to start uh, research. So I don't know, Laiba, if you want me to continue or uh, Dr. Sukai continues and Elizabeth? Yeah, uh, I guess we'll go on with Dr. Sukai and then Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question, um, Laiba. So, so the interesting thing about my career is that um, Disability inclusive research and disability inclusive development is actually not my first career. Um, I'm a geneticist by training, um, as as you heard in in the introduction about me, and and um, I'm a cancer biologist specifically, and that's that's been my background, and, and that that's that's what I spent the first seventeen years of my career really doing. Um, but being a person with a disability. In that space, um, I, I knew that that was a very, very difficult thing, a very tough sell. Um, and so, so the the um, the way that my career ended up evolving was that I got very interested in understanding why it was a difficult thing and, and a tough sell. Why was I the only person um, with a um, why was I the only person with a disability who had been in my space at that particular point in time? Um, and that got me into, uh, into disability in the context of education. That got me into disability in the context of employment. And that was my beginning um, time in disability inclusive research. And, and um, the, the other thing that I would say is I wasn't born in Canada. I was born in the Caribbean. Um, and so, so the, the lived experience of, of people with disabilities in the Caribbean is very, very different than the lived experience of people with disabilities in North America. Um, and it, it's, it's different to the point where uh, sometimes there isn't necessarily a comparison. Um, you know, when, when you're in a place where the major challenge, if you're six years old, is getting into school um, as, a, as a child with a disability, then nobody's going to talk about employment or, or post-secondary education for you because those barriers are well down the road and, and the primary barrier is actually getting you into school. Um, so, so for me, coming to disability inclusive research, I, I came to it um, with that lived experience of, of being from a part of the world where talking about employment and talking about higher education, um, it's, it's only really a conversation that we can have um, in a space where some of the more fundamental um, barriers are addressed. And, and I grew up in a place where the fundamental barriers remain not to be addressed to this day. They, they're, they're still challenges, they're still barriers. Um, but that said, um, you know, I, I, have, I have that perspective that, that I've brought into the disability inclusive research that I do in the context of healthcare and employment and, and, um, and education. And, uh, and so, so I've, I've gravitated to this with that perspective of I'm not I'm not just thinking about it from a um, from a storytelling lens. I'm also thinking about it from a population perspective, and and I'm thinking about it um, the way that that somebody who has done um, large scale health services outcomes work and who's done large scale genetics studies will think about something, and that is um, you know from from the point of view of, of can we actually understand everybody's story, but line up everybody's story so that we're, we're seeing 
experiencing everybody's story. Um, and so it's not just about the numbers, it's not just about the narratives, it's about the combination between the two. So, so that, that's how I've come to be where I am today. Thank you so much. That, that was a great response. And um, Elizabeth, if you can answer the question of whether um, on how you first decided to do research and what got you interested in research and disability inclusive development work. Thank you very much. And then uh, good afternoon from Ghana to everybody. Um, I must say that uh, disability inclusive research actually um, is something that um, I bump into as a uh, part of my daily study as, as an, an employer, an employee with the Ghana Blind Union. Ghana Blind Union is a disability organization which is membership based and, and the members are persons with vision impairment and then low, um, those without vision impairment but have a uh, people with vision impairments at heart. So basically we have the membership comprising of persons with vision impairments and people who are sighted. Um, I must say that um, I want to say a bit of my educational background. I come from a, a community where um, education of gay child is a no-go area because people think, end up investing in somebody who just go and marry and then be in the house of the husband. So it has been a tough time for me growing up and at a point I have to halt my education for the fact that my siblings were dropped out of school as a result of teenage pregnancy. So at that tender age, maybe if I could recall 12, 13, I took a singular responsibility to advocate for my right to go back to school. And um, being successful, then I, I took that uh, secret oath to continue to advocate for the marginalized and disadvantaged in the community. So um, throughout my education, I do advocacy alongside my work. I train as a professional teacher then a bit of it is a radio programs that I do to sensitize the community on the importance of educating their child. So it was along that line that I came into contact with a visually impaired girl who was raped when she was on her way to school. So I must say that interaction with that girl and then the passion to follow up on that case landed me um, in the Ghana Blind Union trying to uh, increase or expand my advocacy work to uh, embroiden, to, to embrace persons with disability, specifically girls and women with vision impairment. So I must say disability inclusive research has been part of my daily work. And my first experience was when we were trying to advocate for access to quality education for persons with disability. And we got into the ministry and we realized that the ministry uh, data performance system excluded the needs of persons with disability. And then, I mean, we, we actually realized that it, it was the normal practice then any information that they take exclude the persons with disability in school. So we decided to do something like a tracer studies where we, 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 we invited persons with disabilities who have experienced the various educational system set, uh, settings in Ghana. For example, those who experience the special education system, those who experience the integrated education system, and then the inclusive education system, the rehabilitation to come and tell their stories so that we'll be able to assess the impact of how the education, the different forms of education they've experienced impact on their social and economic lives. 
And basically, we pick it from there and we started an advocacy that every, I mean, mandated agency that is collecting data should make sure that they, they incorporate that disability specific information so that it may also help to plan for persons with disability as well as the others. Because when we talk about inclusive development, it should be a development that will actually embrace everybody on board and not collecting data to plan for people without disability separately and then leaving those with disability. So I must say basically it has been work and then trying to get the issues and how to actually marry the, the practice and then the academic or the research to ensure that what we do in practice is in sync or in line with what, I mean, is research, research academically. As the, 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 intro, the one who introduced said, I just submitted my PhD and for me, my passion, my focus and my motivation is to uh, drive that um, purpose for ensuring that the research we do, whether for academic purposes or for social purposes, are used to inform the practice in disability field so that we may not seem to be working in parallel as far as, I mean, practicing, I mean, uh, implementing holistic or inclusive development is concerned. So let me say in a brief, this is what I can say. And I've worked with Ghana Blind Union for over 16 years and it has been work what is there how do we ensure that the issues are brought to the fore so that we will get a holistic solution in 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 the implementation of programs that we carry out thank you thank you so much for that elizabeth um it seems like you've seen so much injustice and that has fueled your passion to be a part of this career um, and this field. And that's that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, if anyone has any questions for the panelists, um, you can ask now. Uh, you can raise your hand, use the raise hand function in Zoom, or we can move on if there are no questions. I think uh, you can also unmute your mic if you have any questions and ask a question. Um, all right, we'll just move on to the next, next question, which is uh, please tell us about your educational journey. So your undergraduate experience, your PhD postdoc experience. Um, and yeah, I understand that it's, it's been a long journey. So um, we'll start with Dr. Maxine. Thanks, uh, Laima. So um, in terms of uh, my educational journey, like you were saying, I, I studied first in, uh, in nursing and I practiced uh, here in, in Montreal for a few years in the hospitals and also in uh, community health uh, here in Montreal um, at McGill in different areas uh, such as surgery, emergency, um, neurosurgery. Um, and in different uh, neighborhoods. And after that, I was really interested to learn more about some, some of the uh, very specific, um, let's say, individual uh, behavioral um, aspects of the communities uh, for whom I was working, especially in very multi-ethnic areas in Montreal. So I, I moved to uh, international communi community health and I started in uh, India, in fact, after earthquake in 2001, where the, um, the direct um, involvement with people in villages uh, that were destroyed by the, um, the, the earthquake struck me in the sense that a lot of things that we're learning 
in school or in books are not really happening as such in, in, in the field, in, 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 in the families, in the communities where people are living. And from one mission to another, I did uh, 10 years, more than 10 years in a row. That led me to other countries such as uh, Nepal, Cambodia, Vietnam, working with Handicap International and many different uh, disabled people organizations um, that are experiencing different issues in terms of HIV and AIDS, learning, about um, uh, the different prevention uh, strategies, but also for the local authorities to understand how to ensure that uh, the messages um, uh, can be more accessible and adapted to people with different impairments, uh, be they uh, having uh, hearing impairments, vision, uh, difficulties, uh, people living with um, mental health issues or intellectual impairments, physical impairments, of course. So that was um, the start of uh, my journey that brought me to Sub-Saharan Africa, living in uh, Eastern Africa for a few years. And really, it's the, um, the work that I've done with uh, people with, with uh, disabilities, women and men, uh, experiencing also um, uh, gender-based violence and all the societal biases um, against uh, people with disabilities and the fact that uh, a lot of rights of people with disabilities were violated that uh, led me also to think how can we change or at least contribute to some of the changes in terms of the understanding, but also how practice uh, in the field of international development can um, can be um, seen in a different in a different way, or at least a shift in the paradigms. And uh, this is like I told you earlier. This led me to to quit my job because um, it was not enough to just do, do, do and um, intervene in the field, but to understand also in, in a more systematic, uh, systematic way how information, uh, data, evidence can be uh, harnessed, but also capitalized in terms of dissemination, but more so in terms of how can we influence uh, policymaking all the processes, how policymakers, decision makers make their decision and what kind of evidence and information they need and also in what uh, format. Uh, so that led me to uh, start this, um, the, this PhD that I completed uh, this June. And really um, I wanted also to have another background in terms of educational, let's say a philosophical background. I started all my university undergrad, graduate studies and the master's uh, at McGill. It's an Anglophone um, environment. And I wanted to, to go back to the Francophone um, environment to also marry both um, philosophies in terms of uh, learning, but also generation of, um, of creation of, uh, of knowledge. So this um, made me to decide to go uh, to, to the University of Montreal. It's a Francophone uh, university that has um, a public health uh, school uh, and also teaching global health, uh, especially. Uh, so this is a bit my, um, my educational journey. So like you see, it's not linear, not from bachelor, master's, then directly to a, to uh, the PhD level, but it was a series of circumstances in my life that led me to where I am now and um, being so interested uh, in doing research um, on different disability issues related to public health, but global health, uh, global health governance, and also uh, in policy making. Um, and soon in, uh, in the fall, I'll start my postdoctoral um, uh, studies, so that will branch out a little bit more into a global health, uh, global health governance, uh, looking at um, uh, health equity issues again, but uh, trying to deepen the uh, the theory that I've been using for the five the past five years, which is the inter intersectionality based policy analysis. So 
in a nutshell, this is my uh, educational uh, educational uh, background. Wow, that was very impressive. You've um, it's definitely not linear, but I think that just makes your experience so diverse and um, very necessary, especially when it comes to cultural considerations. You have a lot of knowledge about the difference, uh, differences between um, different communities. So I think that's great. Um, and I'd, we'd like to move on to Dr. Sukai, if you can answer the question of your educational journey. So the interesting thing is my, um, my educational experience was extremely linear. It just wasn't linear in disability inclusive research, um, and 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 I, mean, I think the the counterpoint to um, Dr. Max Sang's journey um, is is that one can do disability inclusive research without actually having studied disability inclusive research, um, and and part of the reason for that is is disability inclusive research now has a name, um, and and now is recognized as a discipline. Um, but when, when I had actually started my work and started my interest in understanding the educational journeys of people with disabilities, particularly in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, and math, which was, as I said, my first entry into disability inclusive research, the field didn't exist as such, right? Um, people were doing work in the area, but it, it, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't called out as a, as a separate discipline. It wasn't recognized as a separate discipline. And, and um, you know, I would say that the past 15 years of my career have been littered with spaces where the work that I've done um, has, helped to, um, has helped to establish or, or really found a, um, a space of research that didn't actually exist before. Um, or, or if it existed, it hadn't, it, it hadn't been anything other than sort of a, a sort of fringe kind of thing. And so, um, so, so I don't have training in disability inclusive research, but I do have reams of experience. Um, some of it is lived experience, some of it's personal experience because of my educational journey in the Caribbean growing up, because of my educational journey um, in post-secondary education through my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD, and then my two postdoctoral fellowships in genetics. Um, in Toronto. Um, so I, I, have, I have that personal experience. I also have the professional experience of being somebody um, who became an accessibility and inclusion professional back before being an accessibility and inclusion professional actually was a recognized thing, um, and who became a researcher within the space, um, and, and who drew on my experiences in other disciplines in order to bring knowledge into the disability inclusive research space. And so, um, so, so you can do this not just from an education perspective, but you can also do this from an experience perspective, because at the end of the day, um, the experience that we have in the agencies that we've worked in, and I've worked at the Canadian National Institute for the Blind for four years. Before that, I had spent a number of years associated with nonprofits um, and, uh, and foundations doing um, doing work that was disability related. And, and so, so by spending all of that time um, and asking very, very important, very necessary research questions within those settings, by building that, that sort of space of research sort of from the ground up, right? Um, it, it, it allows me to, to bring that experience and then marry it to the academic experience in order to have the kind of career that I, I have now. I, I will say that one of the interesting challenges with, with the career that I've had and, and the route that I've taken is that I'm not, um, I don't always find that, um, that this, this combination of professional experience and, and academic qualifications um, gets tons of respect in some spaces. Um, people who, um, who, might, who might do kind of the more traditional um, master's, PhD, postdoctoral fellowship, academic appointments within disability inclusive research spaces will sort of frown upon, and I'm not saying that anybody here does this, but, but I've, I've kind of had this experience where um, people have frowned upon my experience as, as equal to the qualification. 
On the other hand, in people who have lots of experience, because I do have qualification, my qualification is not within the space. And so, so um, people will sort of look at me from the other perspective and say, well, yes, you have a PhD, but your PhD is not in this. So, so really, you know, how good are you? Um, and I, I find that to be, um, I don't say it's to be critical of anybody or anything, but I, I find it to be a very interesting kind of space to be in. Um, because you know, I've, 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 I'm the, I'm the most senior career person on this panel, um, with, you know, my, my time from, um, my time from graduation with my PhD to now is actually 14 and a half years. Um, and my time since I completed my second postdoc, um, was, is now almost nine years, actually nine years and change. Um, and, and so, so I've, I've been doing this a long time, um, but not quite the same way that Elizabeth's been doing it or Muriel's been doing it. And, and so, so those differences, I think, need to get valued and appreciated and recognized um, within the space. And I, I would also say that I think the problem um, of respect that I just identified to you is, is a peculiarly North American problem. Um, and, and in this continent, in this part of the world, there is an emphasis that's placed on the credential, there's an emphasis that's placed on the experience, um, and there's an emphasis that's placed on the credential and the experience actually going side by side together um, and, and operating in harmony, whereas mine, um, my, my credentials lead to a massive amount of experience that I can employ in, in various spaces, um, but my credentials not in disability inclusive research. So, so it, makes, it makes for some interesting conversations that I find will happen kind of in the North American setting, um, but may not necessarily happen anywhere else. And so, so that's, that's a bit of a snapshot of my educational journey. Um, and, and also, uh, I, I run the risk of sounding a tiny bit of a grouch um, when I actually talk about my experience in the way that I just did. Um, just, just because, you know, I, I had a couple of experiences today with some of my trainees that made me reflect on this a little bit. And so it, it kind of just came out that way. Oh, that's, uh, that's perfectly fine, because I completely understand, actually, it's pretty ironic how um, academia and specifically in disability inclusive research, how it can ironically be in, in inclusive. Um, you would think that, you know, the experience and passion that you have towards this field would be just as equivalent to your credentials or um, I guess lack of credentials in that specific field, but um, that's that's really that's really unfortunate. I, I'm I'm sorry about that. Um, but well, there's nothing to apologize for from anybody. It, it's it's just a really interesting thing because it's also a reflection of human nature sometimes. Human nature and also maybe like North American academic culture. Um, so like Dr. Maxing and Elizabeth um, have experience in other other communities and stuff. So maybe they've also been able to see that difference in dichotomy and how academia is in different in different places. Um, but yeah, and thank you so much for your answer. And Elizabeth, if you'd like to respond on your educational journey. Yes, um, thank you very much. Like I did indicated in my introductory speech, my educational journey has not been the smooth one, of course. And like Dr. Saka said, I actually at a point I, I paused and I asked myself, so what am I really into? Because I started like I, I indicated as a teacher, a trained professional teacher. And um, my undergrad, I, I took a course in something like a research. So I did a statistical study, which is more of a research course. And then I came back to teaching and I realized I, I cannot find a space there because what I have to teach and what I have studied is different. And there's that kind of conflict about what are you teaching and what do you know and what have you studied? But of course, in all this, my passion for advocacy continued to drive me. So I continue to do my community work as an advocate alongside the teaching like I indicated. So at a point when I realized that I have to actually find a footing 
and what I am passionate about. Then I pick a job in the Ghana Blind Union. There I continue with my education, the master's level to do development study and major in community work, like I said. So it was around that time that I realized I'm able to connect to what actually I am passionate about. And um, I continue from there, I do my course and then do my advocacy uh, alongside. Then uh, when it comes to maybe uh, short courses at a point at and when I realize that there's a gap, there's a skill gap, then I quickly take up a course to fill up that skill gap. But um, like the previous speakers, I must say all my education has been in Ghana, except the PhD that I decided to do outside. And that one is not a coincidence. It's just because alongside my advocacy work, I also do some presentations on the international platforms, especially big gatherings like uh, Web Blind Union conferences. I take the opportunity to do presentations. So one of my presentations, after one of my presentations, I come into contact with a development worker who said, okay, I think what you are doing, there's a course that will help you to do it better. But this is not to say that without PhD, you cannot do disability inclusive research. Because for me, what is the most important is understanding the rudiments of research and if you are able to do that then you can carry out your research without necessarily being a phd student but for me what i continue to say is the driving force for pursuing my phd is trying to bring along the practice with the academic how do we marry the two so that we can tell our africa stories because you realize that um in most of the I mean, the publications that we have is like the other countries, the other continents, and we have much, we have so much to share, but we are not telling our stories. So that has actually been the driving force for me to do my PhD. And again, like I said, I have been coordinating the livelihood development program for persons with disability and the key questions that continue hitting us is how do we ensure that people with disability are able to get sustainable livelihood so that they may not go back to the streets to beg and that actually is what has I mean propelled me to investigate into that phenomena and uh, I can say that it, it, it's worth carry out a research along that line to actually know what the issues are so that we will be able to inform policy and practice. So I must say basically, even though my education has not been along the disability, the passion for advocacy to bring change has actually driven me into disability and as I, I speak now, I cannot say I am an expert in disability inclusive research, but I can say that with the, the fundamentals that I have, I'm able to actually uncover those stories that need to be told. Thank you. Thank you for that um, response. That was very, um, that was very moving. You, it seems like your passion is what like drives you. And I think that's very necessary in this field. Without passion, I, disability inclusivity, it, I don't think it's, I don't think we can move forward in this field without that, without that drive to help people. Um, so it's not just the academic part that you need. Those credentials are just a very, small part um, to move forward, um, but that drive and that need to help others with disability and others who are marginalized is, is 
even more important. So thank you for that. Thank you for helping others, you know, share their stories. And um, we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Um, because we're getting short on time and we have a few more questions, we'll have um, discussions at the end once we've answered all of these questions. So the next question is, um, We've heard about your current work in the introductions, but we'd love to hear more about um, your current projects and like the things that you're focusing on right now um, and um, the steps you took to find that position or what got you into the current um, you know, field, well not field, but the ideas that you're working on right now. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Maxine. Yeah, thanks. So. Um... For my doctoral uh, research um, for the past five years, I, I, I examined the relationships among legislation, health policy, and the utilization of sexual reproductive health services by women and men with disabilities in the uh, northern um, region, uh, the post-conflict northern region of, uh, of Uganda. So it's a mixed uh, method uh, design with a qualitative predominance. So for the quality of data, I used um, multiple case uh, studies uh, to uh, try to understand and document and analyze the perceptions of uh, five different groups of uh, policy actors. So they are people with disabilities, uh, health professionals, disabled people organizations, representatives of international and national organizations in Uganda, and also the national policymakers. So how do they... Uh, perceive the relationships between um, among legislation, policy, and utilization, and what could be some of the barriers, but also the solutions, how to overcome uh, the barriers that um, they have um, identified. So that was for the qualitative uh, component, and I spent um, almost six months uh, in three northern districts um, of Uganda, um, at the border with uh, South Sudan and uh, less time in Kampala to, uh, to interview uh, the uh, national uh, stakeholders. But it was important to have all the five different groups um, of policy actors to triangulate information, but also to see where are some of the uh, convergences, but also divergences in terms of the understanding of the same issue. So that was for the um, qualitative part. And for the quantitative part, um, I uh, analyzed secondary data from three waves of uh, the demographic and health surveys of Uganda of 2006, 2011, and 2016. 2016 was the last one that was conducted. I think there's one that is coming up, but it's not out yet. So to have also the other part of the story, uh, like Dr. Sukai and Elizabeth was saying, is that it's important to have, uh, for me at least, uh, doing a mixed methods um, study, to have both uh, the qualitative and the quantitative, but also it means to have both the stories, the meanings, um, the experiences of people with disabilities combined with the numbers of the utilization, the prevalence of utilization, and to, to marry uh, the power of those two uh, uh, research um, uh, methods and convey this information uh, to uh, national authorities, disabled uh, people organizations. And also what was um, quite important um, was to develop and maintain a dialogue, uh, an ongoing dialogue with the um, uh, regional and local administrative and administrative um, officers, but also with the district health officers on what I was doing, what was this research about, uh, what were some of the pre preliminary uh, findings, because I know that every month, and every quarter, uh, all the officers are uh, convening and they are thinking and planning. Uh, they're planning about the budget, but also planning about all the strategies. So in Uganda, for example, we have a disability officer that is part of a bigger team 
to, to, to bring about ideas and also strategies. So that was a way uh, for me and the, my, the, the research team to be able also to convey the information on a regular basis, but not to generate information for the sake of uh, the PhD, because to me, that is the least uh, interesting of the doctoral part is, is really to, 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 to be part of a bigger ecosystem of how to utilize these, uh, the information uh, that I was um, uh, creating. So, um, like I was saying earlier, so for both, um, it's a mixed method uh, study, but to guide uh, my uh, analysis and all the interpretation for both the qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, components, I use the uh, intersectional, intersectional approach. And this um, intersectional intersectionality really helps us, uh, I think, both researchers and practitioners to, uh, to highlight some of the invisible uh, social health inequities and make visible the uh, intersectional vulnerabilities and experiences um, that uh, different uh, vulnerable and uh, marginalized groups such as people with disabilities can, can, uh, can experience. So in a nutshell, this is um, the research I've been uh, conducting. Thank you. Thank you for your response. And Dr. Sukai? So I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to build on the last part of what Dr. Maxine said. <clears throat> um, because you, you referred to um, intersectionality in understanding the, the knowledge that we, we um, hear and reflect on uh, when we're working with persons with disabilities. The, the field that I was in before, um, before I stepped away from cancer genetics was a field called personalized medicine. Um, and the basic premise behind personalized medicine in the context of cancer care is every human being is different. Um, every human being is genetically different and that those genetics impact how one responds to cancer treatment. And so what we need to do is we need to take those genetics into account in thinking about how one responds to cancer treatment. And so, so you, the, 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 way to, um, the way to think about um, uh, personalized medicine is the right treatment for the right person at the right time, at the right dose in the right way. Um, and, and what I took away from that and brought into the work that I do now um, is the application of that mentality, that, that, um, that intersectional mentality, that individual mentality, that person first mentality in thinking about how we collect data. Um, because either uh, you will find large population studies um, in the disability study, in the disability uh, inclusive research space that don't take anything other than disability into consideration, or you find very small scale studies where um, when, when that intersectional approach is taken, um, you'll end up with one person whose narrative is actually driving a conversation. Um, and, and everybody's story is important. The problem is that policymakers don't respond to individual stories in quite the same way. Politicians do um, because that's how they get votes. Um, but policymakers don't because policymakers have a very um, I'm going to say old fashioned way of thinking about data, the more numbers they have, the happier that they're going to be, the more likely that, that things are going to benefit a greater number of people. And, and so, so, so for policymakers, I discovered when I started to do this work that um, they liked big numbers. Um, I, I once had um, a study that I presented to them where we looked at the experience of, of I think it was something like 50 graduate students with disabilities um, and what that meant in terms of receiving financial aid from the Canadian government. And, and the policymaker I presented this to said, that's too small a sample size. Uh, so therefore it doesn't matter. Um, and, and one of the things I took away from that conversation was they didn't care um, about the individual stories. And so we had to make them care about the individual stories. And, and the way to do that wasn't necessarily to, to, to give them individual stories and, and, and tug on their heartstrings. It was to basically snow them under, and that, that's a very Canadian term because we're, we're a country that has snow in a lot of it um, through eight months of the year, 
none right now, um, but uh, at least none right now here where I live. Um, but but the basic idea was was we had to actually just snow them under with um, with lots and lots of stories, and then then all of those stories had to be. Um, had to be parsed and interpreted and analyzed in ways that were very much akin to the personalized medicine approach that, that I, um, I, I used to do. And, and so, so when I came to my job at CNIB, um, I said, I'm going to take that personalized medicine approach and I'm going to marry it to doing disability research. And, and that's what's driven my, my research program over the past four years. Um, and, and we do a lot focused on education, we do a lot focused on employment, we do a lot focused on healthcare um, that, that's based on that premise. And, and the premise is we're interested in stories, we're also interested in, um, in numbers. We, we care from a mixed methods approach about both the narrative, the qualitative, and the, um, and, and the quantitative. I care about the focus group and the interview, and I care about the survey. Um, and, and the work that we do, um, you know, the, the, the research that's funded um, is funded to take that approach at a very sort of big picture level. Um, the major grant that we have right now is, is a grant that focuses on building inclusive workplaces um, and actually takes that approach to building inclusive workplaces. Um, we just got uh, funding uh, for a project to do work on, uh, on uh, the accessibility of, um, of uh, the term is procurement, which is basically going shopping um, in the the business context. And so, so if if you have a business and you have tools that the business is using, if the tools are not accessible. The business is not going to be accessible. And so, so again, it's it's workplace related. Um, and so, a lot of what we've got funded has to do with employment um, and secondary to that education. And, and my next my next project is to get healthcare um, and accessibility of healthcare funded in much the same way. Um, I could go on much longer, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Uh, th that was also like, it's very interesting how you um, brought that up because our next webinar is actually about um, data and disability and how important it is to um, personalize those like numbers and how to um, how, how to like bring those stories that people have with disability into that data and how to like uh, basically combine both. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about our next webinar at the end. We're, we're getting short on time, so um, I'll introduce that later. But thank you for your response, Dr. Sakai. Um, I'll go to Elizabeth now, if you can just um, answer that question. Thank you. Okay. So currently, I coordinate all educational programs and then the employment and health related programs. As I indicated, um, Ghana Blind Union is actually an advocacy organization. So most of our activities are advocacy to ensure that uh, persons with vision impairments are properly included in key services like education, employment, and health. So um, my research um, actually is on livelihood development for women with vision impairment. And as we may be aware, uh, because of the challenges persons with disabilities have in education, uh, most of them find themselves at the lower bottom of educational ladder. So um, as a result, they are actually found around the informal sector, but the uh, interventions actually do not properly target their uniqueness. So in conducting my research, uh, in the beginning, I was a bit confused and maybe Prof Lane will bear me witness as to which method or approach to use to um, get the appropriate um, facts that I'm looking for at a point, we were torn between using the narrative inquiry methodology. And then at a point we settled on the case study. And why case studies? Case studies because we I actually want to bring on board both the service providers and then the service users. So um, and Collecting the data, 
I was able to bring on board the government agency responsible for skills training in the informal sector, and then the financial institutions that are also giving some kind of facilities or support for people to establish their own businesses, and then women with vision impairment themselves. And um, he, I can say that uh, that research, I use both individual and focus group discussion methods. And um, I, I realized that it has been, even though I've been in the practice and I'm a staff, it has really been another opportunity for me to learn a lot of things that I did not even know as a, a, a person responsible for advocacy in that sector. Um, and again, for the women, it has been a, a platform for them to actually tell their stories. And the, some of the key findings, um, I mean, point to the fact that um, policymakers and the service providers sometimes, I mean, sit down to think for appropriate interventions or interventions that they think could could work for for persons with disabilities without necessarily evolving them to find out what actually their needs are and and again uh, at at the end of it the both the service providers and then the the service users realize that there is the need to actually change our ways and methods of i mean doing things in order to include persons with disability from the beginning of the programs to the end of the programs it may not be the end but it should be all our interventions should be something like a revolving cycle where we pick we constantly and regularly get input from the people who actually experience disability to know what their needs are and design our interventions to actually respond appropriately to their needs. Again, um, after presenting my thesis, I actually keep asking myself, so what next with all this information? So um, I must say my first publication actually is out. It's, I'm not the only person, but I also contributed to a book that is uh, telling the story, the Africa story on disability. And my chapter is on youth, women, and disability in Africa, economic empowerment, and community strategies to leave no one behind. Because as we are taking the sustainable development goals. We have to also make sure that we follow closely the key principle of leaving no one behind. And that is actually the driving force. I'm actually working on an article too that I'll publish on financial inclusion of persons with disability because without access to financial services, it will be actually difficult to do business in the informal sector. So I may say basically it's a bit of, I mean, trying to put up articles on the findings of my thesis. And again, trying to see how we can engage further with the policy makers and service providers to actually, I mean, amend or review our ways of I mean, providing services to persons with disability in area of employment, education, and health. Thank you. Thank you so much for your response. Um, and uh, I believe we're almost out of time. And uh, I understand that um, a few of our panelists have hard deadlines and so they have to leave. So if you have any, any pressing questions for Dr. Maxing and Dr. Mahadeo, let's ask Dr. Mahadeo first because he has to leave um, the soonest. So if you have any questions, please ask. This is a great opportunity for um, everyone to learn more about their career paths and how to get into disability inclusive research.
We'll stop the recording here so everyone can ask their questions, and we thank everyone who participated in this webinar, and we thank the panelists for joining us and um, uh, giving like their insightful comments on their career and just um, about disability inclusive research. So we hope to see you at the next webinar on August 23rd with Jose Vieira. So we'll see you then. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.